Um, so we are going to see some applications of um, these optogenetics, which is um, our new tools to study real-time um, single cell analysis. And um, so um, I think Alan explained very well why uh, we are interested uh, or uh, many of you know already why we are interested in nanotechnology. And then we are going to see um, these new um, tools to uh, single cell analysis that has been defined as optogenetics. And then we will have, um, we will go through some applications um, in particular of the uh, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. And I'm just actually sharing with you uh, what I've been reading in the literature in the past few months. So we'll see together uh, some of the applications. So again, why we need to, uh, we are interested in, um, in um, understanding what's going on in a cell that is ex exposed to ionizing radiation on any other kind of stress. So um, we use um, nano technology, something that can really go into, into our cell. And uh, for example, these, oops, um, sorry, um, these uh, probes can be coated with, for example, um, silver and gold. And this would be the sensor, the sensor that will help you understand what's going on to analyze uh, what's going on in a cell. So um, um, f already 40 years ago microbiologists knew that some microorganisms produce light gated proteins that regulate ion flows. So and it was in the 70s that uh, this protein, the bacteriodropsin, was discovered to be um, a mediator of, uh, was participating, was an ion pump. So um, um, in the past uh, 30, 20 years, um, a, a whole family of these uh, rhodopsins, or anyway, um, light activated protein has been discovered and they were they have been used at the beginning in neuroscience because uh, just with light you could turn on or off neurons so um, optogenetics started with neuroscience because um, those are excitable cells that could be switched on and off depending on the light so for example you could uh, electrical uh, w you could uh, stimulate um, the cell the neurons just let's say with this red light or for example using blue light and actually making use of proteins that are sensitive to blue light maybe you can excite in this case, n n uh, nerve cells. Or, in contrast, using, like in this case, yellow light, you can exert, you can inhibit the transmission of signal between nerve cells. But as you can imagine, um, this can be applied to excitable cells like neuron or cardiac cells. But if you can just change uh, the membrane potential of your cells, optogenetics can be applied also to any kind of cells. It doesn't have to be just excitable cells. So um, what are some optogenetic tools that um, they are using uh, now in, uh, in biology? So um, they make use of uh, photosensitive proteins. For example, there is a protein, opsin, uh, that belongs to those rhodopsin uh, family, which is a transmembrane protein that is activated by retinal. There is a chromophore that is present in most mammalian cells. So when the light comes, this chromophore, chromophore is activated 
and then it gives rise, activates um, opsin that give rise to a specific cellular signal. For example, there are light activated adenyl cyclase that many of you might know are part of the G um, protein signaling cascade, which is um, one of the major signaling cascades that uh, our cell uh, use for many, many um, endpoints. And for example, the G protein signaling cascade will um, give rise to the release of cyclic AMP, which is a second messenger um, very important for many, many uh, signaling pathways. Another type of photosensitive protein are those channel or drops in. So um, those are channels um, that carry this chromophore that once it's activated, um, let the channel to, to be open. Or in contrast, you can choose to, to close the channel. And for example, we are talking about uh, ion channels for for example, you can decide to uh, open or close calcium channel and uh, just, uh, you know, switching on or off uh, a, a specific incident light. So um, one thing that came up in my mind um, is that, for example, calcium can modulate the opening and closing of gap junction that are uh, one of the major player in uh, uh, um, uh, ionizing radiation induced uh, bystander effect, for example. So you might use uh, this kind of tool, so light to open and close specific uh, connecting channels and then see if you get more or less bystander effect, depending on the cell that you have, cell density, so you can just play um, and uh, design any experiment as such. Another photosensitive protein that has been used in optogenetics are those chimeric proteins like OptoXRS that are made by um, a light absorbing domain plus a protein effector domain. So, as in, in this case for the opto XRS, you have light incident on the opsin that gives, ri gives rise to the activation of the G uh, protein mediated sig signaling cascade. And then there are like also this love 2 plus the, cl the chromo chromophore flavin that seems to be um, implicated in cell movement. So um, I was thinking maybe something like that might be used just with a uh, turning on and off a specific incident light. You might maybe study cell invasiveness. So that could be an application. Or mm, another uh, tool on optogenetics might be the activation of light sensitive enzymes, such as some that are uh, implicated in the activation, in the formation of actin filaments. And then again, you can think about many different applications, about uh, any stressor, so ionizing radiation, for example, and how, uh, if you can control um, actin filament formation, um, uh, um, depending on the, on the stress that you have. And then um, another thing that I found very interesting is the use of optogenetics uh, to have photosensitive release of caged ligands. So for example, you have um, um, some ligands that are um, closed um, in, uh, they are caged in uh, maybe nanoparticles somehow. And with the light, you can somehow release uh, this ligand that then can be um, uh, delivered. Now, the 
I think of this delivery system is that it can work with any antibody antigen couple and so any ligand receptor uh, pair and then if you can think about you can decide maybe just turning on and off switching on and off light where you can uh, you want to release your compound so for example you can think of release a specific a, a certain compound for example antioxidant after a stress so maybe after a low dose of ionizing radiation that could be another uh, nice experiment to to look at and then um, uh, one of the methods that with Alan and in the lab we are interested in looking at is a specific method in optogenetics um, the surface enhanced Raman scattering nanoneedles so um, those are nanoprobes that are coated with gold and silver nanoparticles as I told you before those will work as a sensor so why Raman spectroscopy is based on the scattering of photons by molecular bonds. So you have light that it's, uh, 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 traverse your, your molecule, your compound, anyway, your target. And then upon interaction, the photon is scattered and it can lose part of its energy or can gain some energy and if you look at this low lost and gain of energy with a spectrometer this lost and gain they appear as a as lines so um, you have a Raman scattering which is what they say is stroke shifted when it loses energy or anti stroke shifted when it gains energy so um, the idea is that the scattering of the incident photon causes changes in the vibration of the molecule that it's receiving um, the light so of that substance under investigation so again in view that the with a spectrometer those uh, vibrational changes appear as lines so the, the bottom line of the story is that each molecule has its own Raman spectrum so by investigating, by inserting your nanoparticle and at the end you have your spectrometer, Raman spectrometer you know that for each line you can tell what's inside that cell for example that nucleus protein has a uh, protein have the Raman spectrum uh, DNA has another Raman spectrum so you can uh, start to uh, thinking of what you can do so again our special target would be the cell so we have an incident light and uh, um, Raman stroke and anti-stroke uh, light that is then um, conveyed to a detector and what you get are um, many applications that you can you, that you can do so if you think about um, you insert your nanopart your nano needle uh, in a cell and if you think that if each component each compound has its own Raman spectrum at the end you end up with having a kind of nanomass spectrometer uh, nanomass spectrometer that you have exactly in a single cell or in a single compartment so um, for example you can I'm sorry differentiate the molecules that are let's say you put your needle inside the nucleus of a cell and you can evaluate differentiate the molecule before and after a specific stress for example ionizing radiation or you can measure um, change in membrane potential in excitable and non-excitable cells so now let's go through some of the literature that I'm reading about what people actual, uh, actually is doing uh, with optogenetics 
and you are very welcome to stop me and if you're thinking of um, application that you might want to use or um, please um, let's talk about together so um, for example th this is uh, those are HeLa cells and the nano, the nano needle is inserted either in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm. So this is the blue line for what you get at the spectrometer when the needle is inserted in the nucleus. The red one is when the needle is inserted in the cytoplasm and then the black one is when the needle itself uh, without um, before insertion. So if you look at that, the intensity of these spikes uh, with uh, depending on the, um, in the function of the Raman shift, what's the first difference that you see between the blue and the red um, uh, spectra? Is there any... Sorry. The shift start, starts early when the needle is in the nucleus. The shift starts early. Mm -hmm. We are about 60-60 nanometer. Something else? The intensity and the wavelength. The intensity of the bands. So what can we read at the spectrometer at 60-60 nanometer? Six hundred is normally used for proteins, amino acids. DNA. No. DNA. And as you can expect, there is no DNA in the cytoplasm. So you don't have signal uh, around 60-60 nanometer because there is no DNA. So um, uh, again, oh, yes. I'm sorry, you wanted to ask something? No, no, okay, all right, I sorry. Think DNA is mainly absorbed at 260 to 2. Um, for the Raman, uh, well. This, this is Raman shift. This is this the Raman, Raman shift. shift. Right. Yeah, this is, this is the Raman yeah. shift. Yeah. Yes, sorry. yes, yes. So, um, m an application that you can think about is uh, that you can uh, analyze. Um, compounds in different compartments of the cell and also for example you might decide even to micro inject something in a specific compartment so micro inject for example an anti-tumor drug just in the nucleus or just in the cytoplasm or cytokines whatever yeah, there are many things that one can do and then uh, you can also analyze the response to perturbation in the microenvironment. For example, um, these people, they inserted the micropipette in the cytoplasm uh, before uh, potassium um, uh, chlorine uh, treatment, and then they look at the Raman shift um, time after uh, this um, um, KCL treatment. So you can really choose how to perturb uh, your microenvironment and see uh, what are the, the difference in the compound inside, inside the cytoplasm or the, um, the nucleus. So um, another application would be um, would um, exploit the fact that as you, you, you know um, some um, complexes, molecular, macromolecular complexes, concentrate in, uh, um, are s divided in compartments between a cell. For example, ri ribos ribosome synthesis occurs in the nucleoli, or the DNA is packaged, is folded in uh, um, eurochromatin or um, in, in very highly dense packed heterochromatin. So um, here is are an example, uh, these are examples of HeLa cells and they were um, analyzed, the, 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 the nanosensor was inserted in different compartments of the cell. 
and they were able to evaluate, depending on where the, um, uh, the sensor was, they were able to evaluate, because I, as I told you, each compound has its uh, Raman spectrum, they were able to evaluate the amount of protein, DNA, RNA, and lipids, depending on the compartment. So they put the needle in the centromatic heterochromatin, and as you can see, you have a lot of proteins, RNA, DNA, and lipids. And those are was done in live cells. But then if you go to the extra chromosomal region in mitotic cell, there is no DNA. They couldn't detect. Well, of course, they, they set threshold of uh, DNA level, RNA, lipid level. So there was no DNA in the extra chromosomal region. Uh, as you can expect. Instead, um, in the nucleoli, they could detect a very high amount of protein and RNAs and very little amount of DNA and, and lipids. And then when they, they put their needle in the mitotic chromosomes, they could see, again, a lot of proteins, a very high level of RNA and DNA that you can see, for example, here is 45, here there is nothing, here is 14, here also there is a very little. So in my thought, the chromosomes, there is a lot of DNA. And then I still don't know why there is very, very little need for lipids in uh, mitotic chromosomes. I don't know. So I found just a very curious. Oh. Yes. Is it for DNA? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if uh, it might be. I, I should just look in the literature. I didn't see yet uh, analysis for uh, mm, mitochondria, but yeah, it's something that one can definitely think of. And then just thinking wh why, w how you can use uh, such a technology. So, for example, one question would be, do those Raman spectra in specific subnuclear domains change depending on the radiation dose or the radiation uh, linear energy transfer? So, if so, if something changed depending on these variables, do the cell return to the normal uh, condition? So you can study the kinetics of many things. And then um, another application that I was reading about is uh, optogenetics um, to differentiate in DNA packaging. And this um, uh, paper relates to a different uh, DNA packaging in sperm cells. And it mm, seems that um, differential packaging, in particular in human sperm cells, um, um, influence um, the viability of these sperm cells. So just um, looking at the ratio between um, this, the DNA in sperm cells in, is rich in proto, uh, proteamines. So just looking at the ratio of those proteins that are bound to the DNA, they could evaluate the strength of the uh, DNA packaging in these cells and then make predictions about the viability of human sperm cells. Yes. I think this technique would be very powerful even to study uh, the different stages of the cell cycle. In mm -hmm. the different stages of cell cycle, as you know, the DNA is bound with different types of proteins. During yes. replication, those proteins will Fantastic. be Fantastic. Yeah. So what can really find yes. out about the phase of the cell cycle? I think, yeah, if you um, uh, synchronize you know, you have your set of cells and synchronize them in, in different phases, and then you probe. I, I bet you would find differences in like uh, Raman spectrum. I mean, 
Marcelo pointed out mm -hmm. the limitations of H2AX, whether the cells are in this phase or mm -hmm. the other phase, mm -hmm. instead of looking those different probes, I mean mm -hmm. different parameters, mm -hmm. one can simply do this uh, common spectra. Yes, yes, definitely. And then... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's also yeah, we were trying to think how should we uh, I mean can uh, Raman spectra uh, be useful to evaluate uh, um, to differentiate between chromosomes. So this is something really, really open. I found just a, a paper that was published in 2006. So can we really go from the DNA packaging to the actual chromosomes? So these people, they use laser, uh, laser tweezers with Raman spectroscopy, and they claim that they could differentiate, depending on the Raman spectra, between chromosome 1, 2, and 3. Well, actually, I really look close to those uh, lines and spectra. I, I, I cannot see much of a difference, but they um, evaluated the Raman spectrum of this chromosome 1, 2, and 3 from six donors over 12 days, and they evaluated the, they did a generalized discriminate analysis of of, of such, so they, they say that they were able all the time to have consistent Raman spectra for chromosome 1, consistent Raman spectra for chromosome 2 and 3. And they did something similar, similar analysis. They evaluated Raman spectrum of chromosome, again, 1, 2 or 3, of a single individual over six days. but. Uh, again, this is a, a paper that came out in 2006, had a couple of re mm, uh, comments, so, and eventually those are just chromosomes 1, 2, and 3. But anyway, um, <coughs> this at least opens the possibility to use this technology to also differentiate between a chromosome without any kind of staining or um, any time-consuming uh, assay. And, and of course, you can, I don't know, just let your imagination go and think about different applications of this technique and, um, and m many different users might be willing to use this technique for microanalytical chemistry, forensic studies, um, microbiology, and you can apply, actually people applied um, uh, optogenetics to um, uh, cells, C. elegans, mice, rats, so it's really open and that's it. Mm -hmm.